And I'm going to kind of kick things off with a little introduction before I hand the uh, reins over to Alfred and Ty. So I want to start off by saying thank you, everyone, for being here for our final workshop of the 2021 Austin Fermentation Festival. Tonight, we are hosting Living Vinegar Production and its Applications Within Restaurants and Alpha agriculture um, by Alfred Francese of Emeryn Rye and Ty Burke of Westfold Farm. Um, my name is Nora Shavonik and I am the deputy director at Texas Farmers Markets. Thank you for being here and supporting our local farmers and ranchers. Today is the eighth annual Austin, the final day of the uh, eighth annual Austin Fermentation Festival. And if you don't know already, this event is hosted by Texas Farmers Market, and we're a nonprofit centered around hosting and educating Central Texas producers and consumers to grow a sustainable food system. We love having you here tonight, and we hope that you'll come out and see us at our farmers markets. Uh, we run Texas Farmers Market at Lakeline on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., and Texas Farmers Market at Miller, Mueller, however you pronounce it, on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm just going to go over a little bit of housekeeping tonight before I hand things over. So um, Alfred's going to present first and take some questions, and then Ty is going to present and take some questions. During the talk, your audio and video should be muted, so if you have questions, just drop your name into the chat box, um, and I'll put you in a queue for audience questions at the end of either their workshops, and I'll unmute you if you want to speak. Most people have not been wanting to do that. People have just been dropping their questions into the chat, which works great too. And I will um, field them over to Alfred and Ty during our Q&A segments. Um, I'll, I'll select them to ask. Don't forget that um, we are also hosting, in addition to our workshops, an amazing silent, silent auction. Great items have been donated from amazing local businesses, including everyone's favorite here tonight, Emmer and Rye. They've donated an incredible basket of um, various ferments that are delicious and amazing. And we're really lucky to have them in the auction. And so um, please go and bid on that. Um, there's other great things from Bunkhouse Hotels, William and Chris Vineyards, lots of good stuff. And the bidding is fully virtual through our website, 32 auctions. And you have to sign up for an account to participate. It's going to run until about 8.45 p.m. tonight. So you still have a little bit of time to check it out. Um, and then the auction items will be able to be picked up at our farmers markets or shipped to some out of town winners. We encourage everyone to bid early and often because while this talk is free, any donations that you make or bids in our silent auction will benefit the Texas Farmers Market and our Agricultural Producer Support Fund, which allows us to support farmers, ranchers, and all of our producer vendors during times of crisis. So like during Winter Storm Uri, where we gave out over $20,000 of immediate assistance um, to keep our farmers and ranchers running. And it also provides funding for our scholarship for new BIPOC farmers joining Texas Farmers Market. So please bid generously and I will drop the link for the silent auction into the chat box after the introduction. So now on to our workshop and our amazing presenters. We are thrilled to have Alfred returning as a fermentation festival presenter. He's been with us for many years. And Alfred grew up in Dutchess County, New York and became interested in food and cooking at an early age. Shortly after graduating from the Culinary Institute of America in New York, Alfred moved to Houston where he worked at Pondicherry and Uchi. Throughout his career, he's had the desire to develop stronger connections between food and people by creating smaller food networks in communities that benefit healthy health and um, the economy. In 2017, Alfred joined the Emmer and Rye team where he worked his way to sous chef and head of the fermentation program. His passion is to further explore fermentation as a mechanism to create better ways of preserving food without wasting natural resources on transportation or refrigeration, things we all get behind. Um, Ty is uh, our farmer from Westfold Farm. He was raised on a small cattle operation in Amarillo, Texas, and has lived in the Austin area since 2012. While he was earning his MBA in international development, he became interested in small sustainable food production. Ty and his wife, Sarah, began raising a backyard flock of red dorking chickens and partnered with Emmer and Rye for a chef's dinner, showcasing these heritage birds in the fall of 2017. 
Since that time, Thai has worked to develop a slow growing pasture raised poultry for local restaurants. He's passionate about regenerative agriculture and he carries a special interest in fermentations contribution to the health of livestock and the benefit of the soil. And we're also really excited to announce that um, starting this Sunday, Westfold Farm is going to be joining our amazing lineup of vendors at Texas Farmers Market at Miller on Sundays from 10 to 2 with their chicken meat and eggs. So make sure you check them out the next time you visit the markets. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Alfred and Ty. You guys can take it away. Hi, y'all. How are you doing this evening? Um, Thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, before we get started, uh, I do want to plug Ty being at the <laughs> Mueller Farmer's Market once again. Uh, he, we exclusively buy chickens from him at uh, Emmer and Rye. He also supplies uh, our new restaurant, Kanje. If you guys have not heard of that, you should also check it out. Um, and his product is just really amazing. Um, and one of the people that we're very proud to uh, partner with so yeah. thank you so much for being here tonight and yeah thanks for the invitation yeah. I, it's a great partnership we really uh, appreciate all that you guys do yeah so the reason why ty is here uh with me this evening is uh you know uh it was actually during winter storm yuri that we started to uh, uh use ty's chickens in our restaurants and it began with uh, wanting to feed people during uh, that cold snap when many of us were out of power. Um, and, you know, we contacted a lot of our producers, purveyors and said, hey, you know, what product do you have? What can we buy from you? We're trying to feed people not in a very conventional Emmer and Rye sit down dinner sense. Um, and Ty answered our call and brought a ton of chicken to us, <laughs> who, uh, which we had tremendous time uh cooking and eating and surviving what that crazy week was like for all of us crazy. um but really what ended up happening was during that was kind of our start of our, our relationship and uh you know something that we centered on was uh fermentation and so mm -hmm. ty does fermentation at his farm um not in the same sense that we do it here and Really, we started to collaborate on techniques and production methods. And uh, at one point, we uh, went down this path where Ty was looking for unpasteurized vinegars um, and trying to find a purveyor for that. And basically, I said, you know what, like, why don't we try to partner up and start to create vinegar at Emmer and Rye that we can then feed back into the chickens that we're getting. So uh, we've been working on that system. and. Uh, before we get into that aspect of it, um, I'd like to kind of zoom out for a second onto just acidity and vinegar and all these things and how it relates to food and the way that we prepare food at Emmer and Rye. Uh, and then during Ty's portion of this talk, he's going to talk about how all of this relates to uh, livestock production, how he utilizes at the farm. So um, acidity to me is honestly, the most important important seasoning agent that we have here at Emmer and Rye. And uh, when I first started working here, to me, acidity was vinegar, lemon juice, lime juice. My my idea of what acidity could or were what its utilizations were in, in restaurants were fairly limited to the way that I am now. And uh, I was interested in fermentation before I came here, but I never worked at a restaurant before Emmer and Rye that took it to the level that we did then and that that we do now. And um, what I learned from working here was that there's not just one acid. There's so many different types of acids and they um, change the way, the body, the flavor, the way that you perceive certain things uh, uh, when seasoning something. So something we get asked a lot here at Emmer and Rye is, you know, how do you guys come up with your food? What What is the process for creating a dish, for creating a sauce, for putting something on the menu? Um, what do you all do? And really it's amorphous and there's a lot of things that go into it, but uh, the most challenging and, and thing to our creative process here is the fact that we limit ourselves to um, all Texas grown produce, um, eggs, uh, uh, and then livestock as well. So right now, uh, for a lot of you who probably uh, go to the farmer's market quite often, um, what you're seeing is 
uh, summer crops are starting to move out and we're starting to see turnips and radishes and all, a billion different types of greens. Um, and so our menu flows the same way that that does, where we have to create a uh, 24 item menu at all times that features all these things, but it's always shifting and turning. And during certain times of the, uh, the year or during certain seasons, we're stuck with an abundance of certain things. So we just left summer. A really great example of that is, you know, peppers and eggplant and chiles and uh, corn and things of that nature. And during the peak, peak heat of summer, you know, the array of different things that we have is very different. So we have to reuse a lot of these products in different dishes, but we also have to make sure that they're not redundant on our menu. So you don't just come in and eat here and we just keep telling you about corn after corn after corn or potato after potato after potato. Each thing has to be lively and different and delicious in its own right for it to be uh, considered a different type of dish. Um, and so we utilize lots of different ingredients to do that, but our array of different ferments is really what helps guide these things in different directions because uh, at Emmer and Rye, we utilize products that have tartaric acid in them, citric acid in them, acetic acid in them, lactic acid in them, and at different pH levels and in different forms. And what this does is it can take a sauce that was over here all the way over here dramatically and very quickly um, by just balancing that salt with that acid and sugar and spiciness and umami. So um, what I'm going to do now is uh, Ty and I are going to taste some ferments together and I am going to put him on the spot a little bit now <laughs> and we're going to see uh, uh, what he thinks, what he perceives is more acidic than not uh, for a couple of ferments that we have here at Emmer and Rye. So um, what I'm going to do, Ty, is uh, I see you have your notebook over there. Yeah. I'm just going to ask you to rate which one of these four or these four ferments that I have here from most acidic to least acidic. And at the end, we'll see uh, where it all ranks out in the level of pH. And we can discuss why some of these things may feel more or less acidic than others. So um, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. Uh, you also have your water right here. I recommend between each taste mm. to uh, grab a little bit of water to, to refresh <laughs> your palate. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to have you taste is um, our house made uh, buckwheat show you. And so this is made from uh, koji mold that's been grown on buckwheat and soybeans um, and then fermented. Uh, this is actually part of the fermentation basket. So if you're bidding on that, uh, you will be able to taste this as well at home. Uh, but this is our soy sauce that we use here. Um, so would you rate that as Mildly acidic, very acidic, or extremely acidic? Uh, it feels more mild. Uh, mild. It doesn't feel very strong. It does feel kind of tastes like a more robust um, mm. soy sauce uh, without as much saltiness. Yeah. Uh, is kind of what, but yeah, it, it wasn't shockingly yeah. uh, acidic. Great. All right. So next up, I'm going to have you taste our fermented tomato water. Uh, for those of you who are fans of uh, the cacio e pepe here at Emmer and Rye, this is the base of this sauce. This is the acid that we use for that. Um, so would you rate that more acidic, less acidic, somewhere maybe in between? I'd say considerably less acidic. Less acidic. Less yeah. acidic. Okay. Uh, it's very mild with, not, uh, with no over, strong overtones of any particular yeah. Yeah, flavor. Great. Um, next up, I'm going to have you taste our uh, hibiscus amazake that we make here. Um, and this is actually something that uh, goes into the vinegar making process that we'll go over later. Um, so once again, compared to the tomato water, would you rate that more acidic, less acidic? Where, where would you put that in, in the mix for yourself? Uh, maybe slightly less than... Um... Than the previous one. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, the buckwheat was the most acidic. Yeah. That's probably the least yeah. so far. Great. Um, and so finally, I'm going to have you taste our uh, the vinegar that we produce here. Um, this is going to feel pretty acidic. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'd say this one is down there with the, the buckwheat. Yeah. Um, 
it doesn't have as much flavor, so it's obviously slightly different. But I'd yeah. say, yeah, the between these two, um, those are the the most acidic, and the other two were much lighter. So you think these two, the buckwheat and the vinegar, they're most acidic, and then the amazake and the tomato water were the um, least acidic. Least yeah. acidic. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so to kind of blow the lid off of this, uh, I would agree with what Ty is saying, uh, just knowing these ferments very well. Um, the ironic thing about them is that the, uh, buckwheat and the vinegar are actually much different. Like they're very different in terms of acidity. So, um, we rate all, of, we don't test for the actual percentage of acidity that is in our ferments, uh, but we do go on the pH scale, which is a logarithmic scale. And for those of you who know, um, for each factor, it is going to be uh, 10 times more acidic. So the difference between three and four pH is 10 degrees, which is this very big variance in what that is. So um, our uh, vinegar finishes at 2.8, uh, pH, and we estimate it at about 4% acidity. Uh, and then for our uh, buckwheat show you, uh, it is actually at like 3.6 or 3.7. Mm. And so it is actually, the, the vinegar is 10 times more uh, acidic, acidic mm -hmm. than the buckwheat show you is mm. in terms of the pH scale. And you might be thinking to yourself, uh, why does that, why does that feel that way? Why, why would it, why would it taste so much more acidic? And that comes down to our palate and the way that, you know, our brain kind of tastes things. So um, in our buckwheat show you, we also have uh, a large amount of uh, glutamic acid, uh, which is an amino acid that is comes from the broken down uh, proteins of the soybean. And that is the, the basis of that umami flavor. We also have salt and we also have uh, sugar that is released mm. in this fermentation process. So you have a lot of these things that really make your mouth water. So whenever you taste something very sweet, something very acidic, mm -hmm. I mean, saltiness, we don't like as much when it's very, very salty, but all these things are like flavor enhancers, flavor boosters. They're things that bring more out of something. And so to me, when all of these things are kind of harmonious and aligned, the acidity is almost at the forefront of, of what that is. And so when, whenever we're tasting a salsa emmer and rye, the first thing that we taste for is acidity. And when I'm ranking a balanced sauce or balanced dish or really any of those things, acid comes first. I should taste acid first, then I should taste saltiness, and then I should taste uh, whatever the flavors of that sauce or dish are. Um, and the reason for that is as you're eating something at a table, um, if it's the salt comes first, as you eat it bite after bite after bite, it becomes <laughs> saltier and saltier and saltier. So you almost want that acidity at the forefront to be that reprieve. Mm -hmm. However, um, it should be kind of one note almost in it. It shouldn't taste like, oh, first I taste acidity, <laughs> then I taste salt, <laughs> then I taste flavors or whatever right. else comes after that. That's a, that is almost a sign of something being under seasoned or unbalanced. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, when you're tasting a vinegar, it's just the acid in there. There's a little bit of residual sugar, but not much. Um, however, the, the acid is at forefront. Uh, and so when you go from tasting that to tasting our show you, the perception of it is exactly mm -hmm. that, where you're like, oh, the acid comes first. This is just as acidic as what it may be, when in reality, it's just this bolstering of, of other things kind of around it. Mm -hmm. um, the next uh, top to kind of discuss is uh, both our tomato water and the amazake that I had you taste are actually very close in pH to the shoyu. Mm -hmm. And the, they're actually a touch more acidic. And we, we pull both, we finish both of these things at 3.5 pH. Mm -hmm. So uh, once again, the question is, why does that taste that way? Well, mm -hmm. to me, uh, the amazake is pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. Um, and what that does is when you have that sweetness first, it almost mutes out the acidity from it. Uh, the same thing with our tomato water, where you have this very robust tomato flavor. And that I think is more dominant in this flavor profile. And so therefore the acid and the salt kind of take a, a back burner to it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but these, all these things that we have in front of us are the basis of the cuisine that we've kind of created at Amarin Rai. Mm. And that's why it's so important to have these array of things because as you're creating dishes, certain things have uh, more natural acidity to them already. Mm -hmm. So you may want to just complement it with something that is slightly acidic. So mm -hmm. something that isn't overwhelming or for example, for the cacio e pepe, which uh, for those of you who have dined here, you've probably had before, um, we're taking this mild cheese and pairing it with a more mild acid to create a balanced sauce mm. uh, out of it. Um, and so whenever we have um, new uh, chefs join us uh, in the kitchen, um, the, the amount of different ferments we have and the applications for them are, are a little bit overwhelming for them <laughs> at first. Uh, and they were just as overwhelming for me too. But to me, after, you know, a couple months of working here and learning and seeing the way that we season things and why we season it, um, there's almost this light switch that go, goes off in people's minds <laughs> and they'll be, you know, making a sauce, right? And our, the, our procedure for creating food at uh, Emma and Rye is we taste each other on everything. We're mm -hmm. all very involved in it. So if you're working on a station with a few other people, um, you taste the people around you to make sure that they also think that it's seasoned properly. And then one of uh, the sous chefs, myself, uh, some of the rest of our fantastic chef team also tastes it too. So it's aligned with what our vision is for it. Um, so normally in the beginning, when you're working here, you're, you make something, you bring it to one of the, the chef team and we taste it and we're like, you know what, this is pretty good, mm -hmm. but it could use uh, a little bit of this. Why don't you go in the walk-in uh, cooler, grab out some tomato water and add a little bit of tomato water to it. And you're like, okay, you go and you do it and you taste it. And you're like, oh, okay, that tastes good. And that is teaching by rope almost where we're giving you exactly what you need to do. Um, but our goal is that as you work and progress in our kitchen, you uh, make start to be able to make these decisions more on your own, more autonomously, and you come to them without having it being told to you every single time. And so, as I was saying, after doing this for a few months, my favorite thing in the world is somebody will bring something to me and they'll say like, hey, could you taste this? And I taste it. And I ask them at that point, I say, what do you think that it means? Because mm -hmm. Once again, we're building this knowledge, we're building this repertoire of actual cooking ability instead of just somebody telling you what to do every single time. And they say, you know what? I think it could use a little bit of acid. Uh, what if we put uh, uh, chili LAB in it, which is tomato water essentially, but made out of chiles. And I'm like, you know what? That would be amazing. A little bit of spiciness in this would be mm. great. Milder acidity would be great in it. Could use some salt too. So I think that will balance it all out. It's almost this light switch that goes off in their head where as they're tasting things, they're being able to pair this now vast library of flavors in their head. And once again, like I said, there we could have a very indulgent, rich, creamy, cheesy sauce mm -hmm. that needs acid. And then we could also have a bright, fresh uh, corn relish that needs acid too. And being able to take those two things and as you're receiving them at your table, one, they're basically the same level of acidity because mm. if something was very extremely acidic and something wasn't acidic at all mm. it would then taste unseasoned but having it be very different in the spectrum of flavors that we can create with these things to me is the heart and soul of our cooking where we're taking really great product and we're manipulating it through cooking and curing and salting and all these things but we have a variety of different ingredients just to bolster it, just to make it taste good, make, make it taste better and let that thing really shine for what it is. Um, and to me, white vinegar and a lot of commodity made vinegars uh, take that away. Um, they, they are very sharp, they're very intense and you can only use a sparing amount of them. They just don't have the same amount of flavor. Um, the same thing goes to lemon and lime juice where if I, lemons and limes are delicious obviously but <laughs> if everything on the menu is seasoned with a lemon at a certain point it's all going to taste relatively the same and you can't really build cuisine or flavor from that where utilizing all of our different ferments um uh really allows us to have just a broader spectrum of flavors to pull from um so now that we've talked about that a little bit uh i'm going to go into uh our actual uh, vinegar making process, because that is what I'm sure uh, some of you have come here for, and that's what this whole thing was for. So 
Um, at this point now, we are trying to produce uh, five to eight gallons of vinegar for Ty's production at his farm, as well as five to eight gallons of vinegar for us to use at Emmer and Rye. And uh, at first, when I went down this road, I tried to make a lot of different types of vinegars. And I'd be like, oh, this is uh, Sotol vinegar. This is red wine vinegar. This is lemon vinegar. This is, I have all these different vinegars. This is amazing, but it's gotten to a point where the production uh, has gotten very big. So we're making a one seasonal vinegar at a time. And as something comes into season, we'll utilize that. Um, but part of what we are doing here is we're trying to create this vinegar that one is delicious, acidic, uh, and then also two has all the B vitamins from uh, Koji making. And uh, Ty will go into it more as he speaks about his farm, um, but this uh, ties into Korean natural farming um, and unpasteurized rice vinegar, which has a lot of these really great uh, vitamins, not only for us to consume, but also for uh, his livestock to consume. So to start it out, it, the question is, how do we get this rice into it? How do we get these B vitamins into it? And uh, it all begins with uh, the basis of the alcohol that we create to make it. Uh, and this is rice koji. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. And uh, if you've either ever had soy sauce in your life, miso in your life, um, uh, sake in your life, you've consumed this mold uh, and many of its different forms. Um, so what we have here is uh, uh, rice that has been steamed, inoculated with uh, koji mold, uh, and then uh, let to grow. And what this mold does is uh, it has uh, the amylytic power of amylase enzymes, and it breaks down the starch uh, of the rice into simple sugars and does other things too. But for our process, this is the most important part because uh, what ends up happening is this is where uh, a majority of the sugar comes from for the ferment. Uh, it comes from this rice. And so what we do is we take uh, the koji, uh, add it to water and then cook it at 140 degrees. Uh, and what that does is it allows these enzymes to work really rapidly. Uh, what these enzymes do is take these long chains of starches and snip them, uh, to create, uh, simpler sugars. Uh, and what it also does is it releases, uh, uh, B vitamins, niacin, and a lot of other things that are really, really good for us. So, uh, Ty, the next thing I'm going to have you taste with us is this moldy rice cake. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. It is sweeter than you think it would be. Yeah. And so, like I said, all this is is uh, steamed rice and, and, and mold. And to me, it tastes like, uh, like, uh, an umami rice crispy almost. Yeah. Like it has like a marshmallowy texture to it. Mm -hmm. Um, this texture is a little bit different because we froze it to store and I thought it today for this, but, um, all that sugar is coming just from the rice. Uh, and, What's very special about that is it uh, allows us to uh, control how much sugar we're putting into um, into this ferment. And so uh, the rice that we get changes a little bit over time, but it's pretty much the same and consistent in that. And so we've got a recipe uh, worked out now uh, to create our amazake um, that you see here. And so this is uh, flavored with a little bit of hibiscus um however uh this which you tasted earlier mm -hmm. uh came from this rice and mold and water being cooked together at a very low temperature mm -hmm. um and this is basically the precursor to sake and so um for those of you who have had it um what you then do uh, you take this amazake we add uh alcohol producing yeast to it uh and that you know basically turns into sake. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, uh, what we found is that um, for every 2% uh, sugar, we get about 1% uh, alcohol out of it. Mm. 
And so what we do is we've figured out a ratio of what this rice koji is to water to being cooked. And uh, what it ends up becoming is uh, uh, 10% sugar uh, by volume in this uh, amazake that you see here. So like I said before, this actually comes out very sweet. Mm -hmm. And that's why the acidity really takes a back seat to mm -hmm. it when you're tasting it and the flavor of it. However, once we add our um, yeast to it, it then becomes about 5% alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't sell the alcohol or actually <laughs> consume it for any other means other than vinegar. Um, but for every 1% of alcohol, uh, when you're producing um, vinegar, you get 1% acidity out of it. And so the question is, what is acidity at this point? And um, there are ions that are uh, released during uh, the fermentation process of many different bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it would be acetic acid producing uh, bacteria to create the vinegar that we make here. Um, but when you're talking about vinegar uh, in a lot of different places in the world, it's not judged by pH. It is judged by that percent acidity. Mm -hmm. um, and so in many countries throughout the world, for something to be considered um, vinegar by law, it has to be at least 4%. Mm -hmm. So that's why, like I said, we don't have the ability, uh, we don't have a lab in the restaurant <laughs> to be able to test for uh, each batch to batch what that percentage of it percentage of acidity is, but we know being in this ballpark range, we're probably going to be a little bit above that 4% acidity. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means for us is that it has that ability to pickle. It's like very pungent in its flavor. It's very mm -hmm. pungent in its taste, regardless of what the, the pH ends up becoming. When you have that 4% acidity, you're able to add it to rich sauces and, and things of that nature. And it really has that uh, uh, strong effect that we're looking for. Um, so uh, what we do then is, as I said, we take our amazake, uh, we add our yeast to it, we allow it to ferment. Um, and for us here, we actually use uh, distiller's yeast um, because the, like I said, we're not really uh, trying to create something that we're gonna drink uh, or an alcohol that we're trying to drink. Um, and it's a very efficient means of that. This simple sugar that's broken down uh, into from the koji into the amazake is then very, very readily available to um, yeast. The yeast begins to feed off of it, mm -hmm. begins to multiply. Um, and for us, it only takes a week from it going from the amazake stage to the actual uh, wine stage or alcohol stage. And once we have that, we basically produce these large batches of that, um, and then we store it uh, under refrigeration. Um, what that allows us to do is uh, then feed our vinegar over time. And so uh, while alcohol production needs to be done in a carboy, uh, it should not be exposed to air because you get a ton of different other microbes in, into the mix when you do that. Um, uh, the uh, actual vinegar production of it is quite different where it needs to be an open air mm -hmm. uh, fermentation process. So we go from uh, closed air to open air. Um, and what we do is every time we harvest vinegar, we basically refeed it. Um, and so for example, today, or actually it was yesterday, we harvested uh, 15 gallons of vinegar, half for Thai, half for the restaurant. Uh, and what that means for us is then we then replace it with that amount of alcohol. And so uh, just as the yeast attacks sugar, breaks it down and its outputs are carbon dioxide and alcohol. Uh, when we introduce it to this open air ferment, when we uh, introduce it to our vats of uh, acetic acid bacteria, uh, acetic acid bacteria actually loves to consume alcohol. So what it does is it consumes the alcohol out of this wine. And then it's byproduct of that is the acetic acid, is uh, those ions that uh, create that sharp uh, and sometimes bitter flavor. And so from the uh, wine stage to the uh, actual vinegar stage, we go from a four pH down to a 2.8 pH. And so that's a, a pretty large jump in, in acidification uh, overall, but once we have it there, 
um, we have to be a little bit careful because what ends up happening is if you allow your vinegar to ferment for a very long time, it eventually eats up 100% of that alcohol. And at that point, it starts to go dormant because it has nothing else to feed it. So we have to be very vigilant, actually, by constantly creating uh, the alcohol for this production, constantly creating vinegar, constantly pulling it, and constantly uh, <laughs> then refeeding it so it has <laughs> something to eat. So it's this delicate balance that we we follow here. Um, and uh, it's always a little bit different, which is, once again, like I said, from season to season, from temperature zone to temperature zone, as it gets hotter and colder, um, this flavor changes and it gives us something really living to work with when we're seasoning our food. Um, with all that being said, uh, I would like to open up to questions. I know I just <laughs> went over a lot of information. So uh, Nora, would you help us out by uh, maybe reading off some of the questions uh, that people would like answered? Yes, so if you have questions, drop them in the chat and um, we can get that conversation going. Um, I'll start it off with a question, maybe a more um, simple question for those of us who aren't fully ready to dive into the various pHs of their home vinegar creation. But, you know, I find it really interesting how you guys incorporate ferments into so many, if not all of your dishes in ways that people no, necessarily no. Like I think if the average person looked up a cacio e pepe recipe, it wouldn't include, you know, uh, tomato water, which is like the secret sauce of what makes your um, dish so delicious. So if someone wanted to start um, off by incorporating um, some, uh, you know, unusual vinegars or ferments in some of their home cooking, where would you recommend maybe would be a good place to start? So uh, that's actually a great question. Um, to me, I find uh, that soups and stews typically omit any form of acid in them, maybe other than like a tomato pinsage in them. And to me, this is actually the first place where you should start to play around with acid to have a better understanding of it. Um, for example, things like uh, pork, like pork stew to me, uh, is great in this where usually the recipe calls for onions and garlic and mm -hmm. cumin and some tomato that you roast in there too. But uh, it, seldomly do I come across recipes that say, hey, like, hey, you should put some vinegar into this or maybe mm -hmm. some kind of lemon or lime juice or something like that. So um, I recommend creating, uh, uh, it's also the time of the year for it, like a pork stew. Um, and if your recipe doesn't have any form of acid in it already, uh, cook your pork all the way through, cook your stew all the way through, season it for uh, salt, like you probably normally would when you're cooking anything at home. Uh, and then uh, have a little bit of honey or sugar and a little bit of uh, vinegar or some form of acid that you want to add to it. And when it's done cooking, let it rest. Um, season it with salt get it to that point where you're like, you know, I think this tastes good. Just add a little bit of acidity to it, stir it, taste it again. And what you're going to find is that it like disrupts that whole flavor profile of what the stew is. And it goes from being like, oh, this tastes like pork and salt and a lot of other different things. And it starts to round out what that, what that flavor is. And what you're trying to do here is you're trying to shorten that, those like zaps to your brain between tasting the acidity, tasting the salt, tasting the umami in it, tasting maybe the spiciness if you made your stew spicy as well. And so add a little bit of acid, stir it, taste it, add a little bit more and get it to a point where you're like, you know what, this is like tasting pretty good now. It's got some brightness to it. It's rounder in flavor. And then uh, add a pinch of sugar or honey to it. Stir it once again and taste it again. What you're going to find is as you kind of play with these levers, all of a sudden, it's going to start to taste a little bit less salty. It's going to taste a little bit more acid forward, but it's going to taste fuller in your mouth. And so uh, whenever I'm creating a stew, I'm usually pairing it with a starch, and sometimes it's potatoes, sometimes it's rice, and it could be a lot of different things. But you really want that stew to be like uh, almost a little intense so that it can wrap around these things and flavor it. Uh, and what you'll do is as you're playing with these different levers of it, you're going to try to get to this one 
flavor of like, you taste it and you're like, this just tastes good. Like, yes, I can taste that it's, it has some acidity to it, it has some salt to it, but it's round. It like fills my mouth. It makes, it makes it me like want to take another bite out of that. Um, and that to me is a really great place for it. Um, uh, the next, uh, recipe that I would say is something that could always use a little bit more acid is if anybody here is a fan of lentil soup or split pea soup, that's another recipe where I find that people or a recipe that I've seen a lot of that doesn't have acid to it. And once again, it's like, it's watery in nature, but it has a lot of starch to it. And you need that acid to kind of break through that. Um, so those are my two recommendations for something to cook and put a little bit of acid into that you might not normally add. Delicious. You're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. We've got some great uh, questions coming in through the chat. Um, so next up, somebody asks, what has been some of your favorite accidental discoveries working with fermentation? <laughs> uh, let me start out by saying, um, I've had a lot of accidents, uh, <laughs> fermenting, um, uh, in terms of like just unexpectedness. And my favorite thing to, uh, talk to people about when they start, start learning about fermentation, especially within the restaurant is that, um, seldomly do you start with an ingredient or a flavor and ferment it. And it tastes like that at the end. <laughs> so a lot of times people are like, I want to make a basil vinegar. And I'm like, that's really great, but it's not going to taste like basil in the end. Uh, and so m one of my favorite things I've come across uh, while doing this is um, uh, just really uh, finding the things that are transformative in that. And to me, when it comes specifically for vinegar production, um, uh, fermenting teas are actually uh, a more stable base where you get an output that's very similar to the input. So uh, just recently to make this uh, hibiscus, amazake, and soon to be vinegar, um, we partner with another farm called In the Garden Farm. I'm actually wearing their t-shirt right now. I don't think Damon's <laughs> watching, but if you are for some reason, hi Damon. Uh, and he uh, started growing hibiscus um, and they created these pods or buds before it actually flowers um and he picked them for us and he brought them to us and he was like can you do something with this like what ends up happening is he gets a much lower yield if he lets it flower and go all the way go through that whole process and it's not as good for the plant either um and so it tasted like hibiscus but it had like a very uh slimy texture to it almost like nopales or uh cactus like or okra or the things of that nature. Right. And so, uh, we really wanted to, we never had hibiscus that was grown in, in Texas before. And it was like a new flavor for Emmer and Rye. And when we come across those things, that's like a almost like a religious experience because we're like, Oh my God, thank God. We finally, we finally got some hibiscus. And so, uh, at first we went through a lot of different trials for it. Uh, the first ferment that I made out of it ended up being gummy vinegar which like it was like stringy and slimy vinegar which nobody wanted it was not very good uh then we tried to make uh, a hot sauce out of it by grinding it and lacto fermenting it and turning it uh with some chilies and trying to turn it into this hot sauce once again was not really great on the palate was not super fun to eat on its own and then finally we were like okay now we're going to try to turn it into, we're going to try to dry it and we're going to try to turn it into a powder. Uh, and for us, we do that with a lot of different things. Uh, and it's the easiest thing to do for us. So it's usually one of the last things we do. And so we dried the buds um, and then blended them into a powder. What we found is when we dried them and rehydrated them, for whatever reason, that texture didn't return. Uh, and so, uh, we were then able to start to season sauces with it. We were able to create this amazake out of it. Uh, that's really fun and delicious. Um, and so that is something recently that we've done here. That's been very interesting where you go through all these different processes, uh, and each time you learn something about, uh, either a fermentation technique 
or a, pr a product that you didn't know. Um, and sometimes it takes multiple different tries, multiple different techniques to apply it to before you come to uh, an aha moment where you're like, okay, this is great now. And so now um, that we're able to buy all of these hibiscus buds from him and have a way to process them and outlets for them, you'll now have hibiscus in the restaurant year round that has been preserved that we can then add to dishes all throughout the year. And that is something, like I said, that is just something that we didn't have before now. You know, uh, we this restaurant's been around for six years and now we finally have something new to play with. So uh, yeah, that's what that's, it's hard to pick a favorite, but that's something recent that was a lot, very enjoyable to go through. Amazing, amazing. And I'll, I'll say that sometimes at the farmer's market, our um, farmer new leaf agriculture will sometimes have hibiscus. So um, uh -huh. if people are interested in trying, um, drying and rehydrating, they should check out the farmer's market. <laughs> um, all right, uh, another great question. Um, Alicia asks, I've brewed kombucha in the past and the way that you talk about harvesting vinegar feels similar. Do you end up with a mother or a scoby in this process of cultivating vinegar? Uh, yeah, uh, we do. Um, it's a little bit different than um, a kombucha mother. It's less like solid uh, in that. <clears throat> so uh, it is very similar uh, in that where it's the same thing as uh, kombucha where kombucha is symbiotic where the yeast and the bacteria are working at the same time, where the vinegar making process, we just have separated that and it's a, it's a different bacteria. So uh, what ends up happening is that pellicle that's over the top, that, that uh, mother uh, is also a byproduct from uh, acetic acid bacteria. So you will end up getting a vinegar mother. You will end up getting little pieces of yeast strands in it, very similar to kombucha. Um, so yeah. To answer your question, yes, we do. Great. Somebody else asks, what are some um, books or literature that you reference in your um, fermentation practice? Uh, yeah, that's uh, a great question. Um, Sandor Katz is my uh, favorite uh, fermentation author. Um, uh, wild fermentation uh, to me was really great because uh he told the story and the like the cultural significance of a lot of the ferments that he has experienced or tasted or done and to me uh you know fermentation is nothing new like it's been going on since before humans walked the earth uh microbes have been breaking things down and turning them into uh other so like subjugate uh pieces of matter and uh to so when I'm approaching fermentation within the restaurant, I'm not ever trying to like, like create something new that hasn't been made before. I'm not like, I'm not trying to uh, change what history has done basically. And so when you start to ask the question of why uh, a ferment is the way it is, or it behaves the way it is, or with certain inputs, you get certain outputs, or why traditionally these ingredients were used, uh, it really helps to piece together creating a recipe and a, and a method uh, because normally these bacteria and yeasts have uh, been partnered with these other products over time for a very long time. And so if you look back at the history and the roots of each ferment and why it was done the way it was done, it helps troubleshoot recipes um, that you may be struggling with or when you are trying to apply a new uh, new or different uh, piece of produce or something to a ferment and to bridge the gap to understand what is that the mechanism that's going in that. So I think he does a really good job of doing that. And then uh, the Noma Guide to Fermentation is also a really great resource. They uh, did a fantastic job of creating actual, you know, very methodical step-by-step -step recipes for these processes. Um, and so if you're looking to get a recipe that is, you can just execute and repeat and you're not really trying to figure out maybe the depths of what that ferment can be, that's also a really great book to reference um, too. Uh, I'd say start with those two and uh, 
Uh, Sandor Katz also references a lot of books in his book, which is also super fun. So as you're going through the chapters of different ferments, um, he will actually reference at least one or two books in each one of those chapters. So if you go on that deep dive, we can learn more. Wonderful. Okay, I'll, I'll take one more audience question and then we can kick it over to Ty. Um, so someone else asked, is there a type of vinegar that you would recommend for um, beginners first learning how to make vinegar? Um, yeah, so uh, when we're pretty, so to kind of like zoom out a little bit from what we actually do at the restaurant, because at this point, our process is fairly complicated because we create the alcohol ourselves. Um, you don't actually have to create the alcohol yourself. So, sorry. Um, so you can take beer or wine and actually uh, start vinegar out of that. And so if you're at home and you're trying to uh, make vinegar, it's your first attempt at doing that. What I recommend doing is get yourself some Bragg's vinegar, living vinegar. That's very important. Uh, a one gallon jar, uh, filling up the one gallon jar about 25% of the way with that Bragg's vinegar, um, and then taking a beer or a wine or even a spirit if you wanted to, and diluting it to that 4% alcohol. So uh, something that's very easy to do is most red wines are 12 to 13% alcohol. So if you do dilute that uh, into a third, you usually get about 4%. And then take that 25% of living vinegar and add 50% of that diluted red wine on top. Cover it with a loose, uh, I love to use coffee filters for small jars and a rubber band to keep pests out and allow that to ferment. And that will produce you a red wine vinegar relatively quickly. That's very delicious. And that process in itself is very easy to do. Um, once again, uh, as you move on from that, there's a ton of different experimentation that you can do for that. But red wine and vinegar have been hand in hand for a very long time. And so to kind of get your head wrapped around that initial process, that is something that I would recommend doing. Wonderful. That's, that is a perfect tip for, for beginners to, to kick it off. All right, shall we, shall we let some, and there, there can be some more uh, time for questions at the end too. I just wanna make sure we get enough time for presentation. Did you wanna move forward, Ty? Talk sure. Chickens and egg? Yeah, yeah. Uh, before, sorry to cut you off, but um, for those of you who, if anybody had any other questions that didn't get answered, I'm more than happy to wait afterwards to answer a couple more as well. So, well, we'll get Ty going on it, but. Yeah. Uh, same here. I've cleared my evening schedule for this. So, uh, which is generally going to bed early. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that was a great introduction, both by Alfred and by Nora there. So don't feel the need to necessarily go over that. I do think it's important to highlight some of the practices that we do that kind of separate us from what you might be more familiar with, with uh, poultry production. So all of our chickens are raised on pasture. So they spend uh, about three to four weeks in an environment that's more controlled um, because as chicks, they have that fluff and not feathers. They can't regulate their temperature as well. So in the summer, they spend three weeks in there and in the winter months, uh, they spend four. Uh, and then we put them on pasture for a week from there until about nine weeks old. Uh, and so I'm sure you've seen hoop house greenhouses. It's the same idea except for they're on skids and we pull them through the pasture and it's kind of like uh when you eat corn on the cob one row at a time like we just work our way through the pasture pasture like that uh, obviously no antibiotics or hormones uh the rotational grazing that i mentioned uh and there's no animal byproducts so oftentimes in feed you'll get uh, crustacean meal or feather meal or uh, fish meal isn't a popular one, is a popular one. So we don't put any of that in our feed. Um, it's certified organic uh, and the feed is what a big part of what we end up doing. So the feed, because it's organic, so people say, why not not just non-GMO? Well, non-GMO doesn't, the, we want to keep glyphosate out of our feed because it'll go through the chicken and onto our pasture and impact uh, what grows in our pasture. So uh, 
our feed is certified organic, but our farm is not. So I want to be very clear about that. Uh, we have not, you won't see the organic certification sticker on any of our products, uh, but all of our feed is certified organic. Um, we get a custom ration made with flax and human grade soybean meal and wheat. Um, and we put a little bit of oregano. We don't want to use antibiotics, but a small amount of oregano will have antibiotic properties in your feed. Uh, but what is interesting is that chickens drink twice as much as they eat. Uh, and so it's incredibly important, the quality of the water that they're drinking. Uh, and that kind of, you know, as a, I didn't go to school for poultry uh, or anything like that. So when I came across that, that fact, it, it really made me think about the quality of the water that our chickens are getting. Uh, and chickens are fantastic animals. Um, they produce a great amount of protein, but they have two major weaknesses. One is their lungs. Uh, they have forced uh, expiration, whereas we have forced inspiration. So we work and use muscles to breathe in and they use muscles to breathe out. So, so it makes them more pr prone to some respiratory issues. And the other one, they get most of those diseases through their intestinal tract. And so it's important to have incredibly high quality water to prevent uh, those bacteria, viruses from getting in through the stomach. So as I begin to look at, all right, water, didn't think it was a big deal, obviously much more important. What do we need to do? Uh, so it turns out chickens can drink water all the way down to like 3.5. Uh, even though they can go down to two, but that's incredibly uh, caustic on whatever you're watering through. Uh, and they don't really like that quite as much, but they'll go down to 3.5 just fine. Uh, and that's that's really quite low. Um, and also as we make that water more acidic, it has an appetite stimulant property, uh, kind of like bitters, uh, when they used to eat that before a meal to stimulate their appetite. Uh, and so it, it makes them more voracious as far as hunting down grasshoppers and eating more grass. So we thought, well, maybe that's the key. Maybe we can take our water and we can get that pH down there to stimulate their appetite and to prevent this bacteria from getting in there. Uh, and an important, you know, an important part of that was figuring out where do we start? What's the pH of the water now? What's the quality of the water? So we're out in driftwood and the hill country is known for having E. coli and any number of other bacteria in the water source. I'm sure you've seen when it rains a lot, they cut, they close down. Barton Creek, they closed down, Jacob's Well, they closed down uh, all of these because of the bacteria. And that's because the watershed goes underneath all this uh, industrial agriculture production that then gets down into the water source. And so our water isn't filtered or anything. It's just straight from the well. Uh, so we didn't necessarily have it tested, but we're pretty certain there's a number of uh, inhospitable organisms in there. So there's a couple of ways to lower the pH. You can use inorganic acids like uh, peristic acid or hydrogen peroxide to drop that. Um, but you can also use organic acids to make that happen. And there's a couple of options, formic acid, um, butyric acid, lactic acid, and uh, acetic acid uh, that is in vinegar. Uh, and so Hearing that there was a program here at Emmer and Rye where they were making a living vinegar, uh, that's uh, a step above, several steps above, just getting uh, a dead uh, vinegar off the shelf uh, at say HEB or something like that, because it has all those additional enzymes and vitamins and things like that. At the time, we were using uh, a, a rice wine vinegar uh, that we bought in bulk just to help drop that pH. Uh, and when we partnered here and I proposed to Alfred to make, you know, we did a couple of trials where we're using a little bit of water. Um, and then we said, well, why don't we do it for every chicken on the farm? And so that required the scaling up process that he mentioned, but we put that vinegar into the water to drop the pH so that it helps the chickens, helps them stay healthier. Uh, and that we use the, the balance between lactic acid and uh, the, the acetic acid from the vinegar to drop that pH. And it's, in my mind, a great combination. Um, as he mentioned, I've been dabbling in Korean natural farming, which is in large part about 
soil health and growing things, but there is a small section that talks about chicken and, and pig production. Uh, and Korean natural farming is a traditional method that's been passed down through oral tradition in Korea uh, about making some of your own inputs for gardening uh, and so forth. So it's a very oral tradition and it's very Eastern. And so a lot of this with my MBA and analytical mind, it drives me crazy sometimes because it it's not very well explained. Like this is the way you do it. And you go, why? And they go, well, that's the way it's always been done. So you don't really know some of those details uh, on variables and can I do this or can I do that or what happens here? Uh, so it's been a bit of a process and a journey and, and our operation as far as fermentation is considerably uh, lower tech and uh, more basic, but it, it still produces the enzymes and the acids that we need. So we get the acid, the acetic acid, the vinegar uh, from Alfred. He gives it to us when we deliver. Uh, we take it back to our place and keep it cool. What we produce ourselves is a lactic acid bacteria. We call it lab. Uh, and there's a couple of ways uh, that it's produced the way that we do it. It's the way that it was taught uh, through the Korean natural farming. And this is something that you can do at home. It's very basic. So the first thing is you need some kind of starch water. So this is uh, rice from here at Emmerin Rye. And basically you can use the water from boiling potatoes. You just need starch water. So I'm gonna take some of this water here and pour it in there. And you're just trying to get that, that uh, you know, just like when you rice, wash the rice before you eat it, right? You just kind of mix it up. And then except the only thing is what you normally pour down the drain, uh, the water from mixing, uh, obviously it'd be better if you don't do it with your hands to get some contamination in there, but you're gonna get that cloudy rice water at the end. That's what you're looking for. So the next time you make rice, save that rice water, put it in, a, in some kind of a vessel and you're gonna set it out. Like the, the coffee filter and the rubber band technique is good, throw a towel over it, just something to kind of keep things out. And it, it's gonna vary a lot with temperature. We don't have a controlled environment, just set it out somewhere out of the sun. Uh, and so on warmer times, it's gonna be ready sooner, colder months, it's, it's gonna be ready a little bit later. But in the next 24 to 36 hours, it's gonna go through that process. And you'll notice at first when you smell it, it's going to be quite starchy. Um, and as you continue to smell it, there's going to be a brief, relatively brief, several hour window where it's going to smell slightly sweet. And that's when the lactic acid bacteria is at its highest, or at least that's what we've been told uh, from the Korean natural farming. And so you want to catch it in that window. So if you, you smell it, it still smells very starchy, no change, let it sit a little bit longer. If you get to it and it starts to smell yeasty, then you've waited too long. You've missed the window and it's going to start to smell rancid uh, soon after that. So you don't want any of that. And usually by that time, there's some kind of film that develops on top. You'll see bubbles in there. That's too far. Uh, but it, trust your nose. It's going to smell slightly sweet. And at that point, when it's slightly sweet, you add it to milk. Milk of any kind from any mammal uh, of any fat percentage that you want. You can use dehydrated milk at a ratio of one to 10. Uh, and if you've ever made cheese, you know that if you leave milk out, it separates, right? You get the curd and the whey. Uh, and in this process, you're interested in the whey at the bottom. So I usually use uh, a whole milk because I like to get as much curd as I can out of it if I'm going to go through the process. But you'll find that with this in there, it's going to separate a lot faster than if you just set milk out for it to make cheese. So this usually happens again, temperature variation in 24 to 36 hours. Again, it's separated. You've got the curd on top, the whey on the bottom. You take that curd out, you siphon the rest of that whey. You don't want the little particles that are gonna be on the bottom. You want that nice middle whey below the curd above the kind of essentially dregs on the bottom. And that's gonna be what you're looking for. Uh, and that's very high in lactic acid. And the reason they do it when the starch first, um, at least again, when you ask a lot of whys, you don't necessarily get a very clear answer. 
but the thinking is is that the starch environment um, isn't a very hospitable envi hospitable environment. Uh, those starches will eventually turn into sugars or can be converted into sugars, and so you only get the strongest lactic acid bacteria will survive in that kind of environment of uh, lots of starches, not a lot of sugar. Uh, and so you're pouring those super strong lactic acid bacteria into an environment uh, where it now has tons of sugar from the lactose in there. It consumes that rapidly. That's why you get a quicker division between the curd and the whey. Uh, but we take that out. That pH range is very similar to uh, the vinegars. It's down in that two to three range usually. Um, and so when we add both of those to the water, they're both working to lower the pH uh, and the lactic acid bacteria works in a very unique way. Uh, one of the Korean natural farmer uh, teachers calls it the police. Uh, it has a way of keeping the bad bacteria down or at a lower percentage while not killing or messing with the good bacteria. And so um, it works in that really unique way that you can add it to other acids with other enzymes and bacteria without a lot of concern that you're going to kill off that other ingredient with your lactic acid bacteria. I mean, probably happened to some degree, but not, uh, not devastatingly so. So we add both of those to the water so that when it goes into the chicken, you've got the lactic acid bacteria, not only lowering the pH to make it less hospitable to the harmful pathogens, but actively working uh, to remove them from the system as lactic acid bacteria uh, and the acetic acid also, again, bringing down that bacteria. And that goes through the chicken and then it goes on to our pasture through their manure. And it just, it's a way for us to spread that good bacteria and get it worked into our soil without us having to do very much effort at all. Um, it passes through the chicken, uh, does a, some really great things while it's in the soil uh, and it helps regrow with that additional nitrogen from the manure. Uh, and it's a pretty amazing process. Now we also have our water go through a carbon and a UV filter uh, because again, it's unfiltered water. So we try to make the water as clean as possible. We put our ingredients in it then, then it goes to the chickens. Uh, and it's important to know that when you're making this, like they give you standard ratios for how much of the lactic acid and the vinegar to put in the water. Um, but that's kind of dependent on how hard or the acidity of your water. So I got, this is some water uh, that from Emmer and Rye here, and this are, uh, this is Emmer and Rye water, and this is water from our, the well on our farm. Uh, and just drinking them, you probably wouldn't notice a huge difference, but one of them, the one from Emmer and Rye is at a nine pH, and the one from our farm is at 7.6. So there's already a pretty considerable difference. So we don't have a recipe per se of put in X amount. Uh, the pH of the water is gonna vary with the seasons and the temperature. So we just shoot for getting the water down under six. Once you get under six, a lot of those bacteria like E. coli and some others really have a hard time surviving. So we wanna get it at least under six. Ideal scenario would be around 4.5 to five uh, would be a good range depending on you know, how much vinegar and how much lactic acid we have. Sometimes we go with a 5.5 because you're like, I already put a ton of everything in there. So we're just gonna, this is it's gonna be all right for now. But that's kind of, we don't necessarily have, you know, if you're gonna try to write down a recipe, that's not really how it works because of the difference in the temp, the pH. We're, we're shooting for a target pH, like you're saying. Yeah. So it depends on where the pH is you're starting and where you wanna get to. And you add enough of that to get down to that level. The lab is usually we start at a 500 to one ratio. Um, and usually in Korean natural farming, it's given with sugar. So that lactic acid bacteria has the sugar to continue to survive and thrive. That's what we're trying to dial in because if you put in too much sugar, that vinegar is going to start to form a mother and it's going to clog up all of the plumbing in our watering system. So we've got to find a right balance of adding enough uh, sugar for the lactic acid bacteria to continue to survive and thrive without giving it so much so that the vinegar starts to make more vinegar. Um, so we're still kind of feeling that part out, uh, but that goes into our water. And then we have a product called C90, which is a dehydrated sea salt that has all of those trace minerals and nutrients that you get in seawater. Um, but since we send it through a carbon filter 
and then that UV filter, a lot of those trace minerals are uh, filtered out. Uh, and that, because our water is so hard, we do that to take out some of that calcium. So we got to add that back in, especially in the summer, those additional electrolytes really help the chickens with, with some of that heat stress. Uh, but that's the general process of how we make our water and the impact it has on the farm uh, is uh, it smells less. Uh, healthy chickens shouldn't smell. Uh, so if you are going out somewhere and it smells like an industrial poultry farm, then there's already uh, a number of things wrong. But it reduces the smell and it's important because uh, poultry manure is a hot manure and that it's high in ammonia. So if you've ever gone and got really cheap chicken uh, and you cook it and it smells like ammonia when you open the steamer or something like that, uh, that's because all of the ammonia that comes out into the manure is then breathed back in through their nose uh, and it does horrible things to the meat. They have standards where they have to keep ammonia levels below a certain parts per million in the air. We don't have to worry about that. We're out in the open air, uh, but it, it helps the meat uh, taste better because it, it's free of that ammonia type impurity. Uh, the chickens are healthier. They're more active. So they're foraging more. They're eating more grass. Uh, the more of that that they eat, the more intramuscular fat, like Alfred would tell you that our chickens, the fat is not white, it's more yellow in color. Uh, there's more fat, intramuscular fat uh, inside the actual muscles. So whenever you get our chicken breast, they're incredibly, the boneless, skinless chicken breasts are known to be very easy to dry out. That's just, you know, you go a minute too far and then you've got, you know, nice white cardboard uh, there for you. But ours is uh, almost impossible to dry out because of the, the high amount of additional fat that comes from a healthy chicken foraging more and getting more of those nutrients in there. The skin uh, as well has more fat in it, more flavor. Uh, and so it makes a huge difference. You wouldn't think that just dropping the pH uh, in the water would make such a huge difference, but it really does um, in the overall health of the chicken. Yeah, an interesting side note for that. So. We actually take um, Thai's chickens and uh, we brine them again in the Amazake. So they're mm. getting they're getting hit with this uh, mold multiple times. But uh, we actually so we have to brine them and then we actively dry them in our walk in. And so we use a fan and a dehumidifier for that. And what it allows us to do is get a very crispy skin. But even after we've like actively dried the meat slightly, it still doesn't get dry, which is, it, it is a testament to all the processes that uh, Ty does at Westfold Farm, the intramuscular fat that he's speaking of, and just the overall goodness of the meat uh, that we get, that we, we can dry it and it's still not dry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible. Uh, and, and the chickens are uh, fantastic at kind of telling you what you need. So you'll go out in the summer uh, and they've learned when we come by with the trailer that it's time for water. And even if there's water already in the, the, the tanks that we have for them, when we add more, they just hit the water super hard because it's nice, freshly mixed. It's got all that good stuff in it. And those B12 vitamins, especially like um, we could go into what the important vitamins are for chickens. But uh, the short story is, is that the B vitamins are especially important for chickens, especially young chickens. Um, and so by getting them the, those B vitamins and they break down quickly so that we get feed about every two months and it's in an outdoor silo. And so as that, there are a lot of vitamins and minerals that break down in the heat. And so the reason we get feed so frequently instead of buying you know, six, eight, nine months at a time is to keep that feed fresh and to keep those vitamins and minerals intact and available. And what this does is supplements that. So as it sits, and especially over the summer when it gets hot and those break down, instead of not getting it through the feed, they can get some of those vitamins through the water that's coming through the vinegar. And so it makes a big difference uh, for those young birds. And especially as chicks, they're, you know, they just came, they haven't set the pH of their stomach yet. Over time, it will drop into the two to three range because your stomachs are the most acidic part of the digestive system. But what this does is it gives them a jump start. So the protections that humans have against a lot of bacteria is that low pH of their stomach kind of helps prevent an, a natural defense against some of that bacteria. 
And so the chickens, when they first show up, they haven't had the ability to drop the pH in their stomach yet. So we can expedite that process by giving them this vinegar and this lactic acid in the water, drop that pH for them so that we don't lose as many chicks in the first three to four days, uh, which is when chicks are extremely vulnerable to sedosis and a number of other bacteria because they haven't developed those natural immunities. Um, but it's been great. We've seen great results there for a while. We actually for lacto fermented all of our chicken feed. Uh, we were putting all of our feed in water, adding a little bit of lactic acid, and then feeding that out, always kind of back batching it kind of like a sourdough with a starter in the bottom to kind of help speed that process. But as we continue to do that and our scale continued to grow, you know, we were doing that for 100, 200 chickens. Well, now we get 350 a week. And so we can't really the scale of trying to manage, like how do we make a scaled up version uh, of a fermented feed production? Uh, and we haven't really found an answer to that, but we're gonna continue to work with Alfred. And it's something we wanna come back to uh, because it, again, uh, it helps in a number of ways through the birds. So instead of just coming through their food, they would get some additional coming through uh, their feed as well. And that's something that as our relationship continues to grow between the restaurant and the farm that we hope, you know, maybe we can test it out on a small scale, get a good system down and then find a way to scale it up to provide fermented chick, uh, chicken feed for all of our birds. So um, yeah, we're a big believer in fermentation and the power of chickens to help sustain and, and uh, re-energize uh, the land. They've got uh, two rakes at the end of each leg and they're just uh, fantastic at re- putting more nitrogen into the sto soil of uh, here in central Texas, where most soils, unless it's a managed farm, is going to be incredibly deficient in nitrogen. So um, yeah, we've harnessed the power of the chicken to provide fantastic food for our community and to help start um, regenerating the land that's been um, kind of just left to its own devices out here in central Texas. So that's pretty much all I had uh, for you guys to go through. There's a lot more to Korean natural farming. If you look into that, there's probably eight or 10 or 12 different solutions that they use. Uh, we've kind of kept it to some of the basics here just uh, for this presentation and just to kind of simplify matters on our farm. But there are some resources out there if you want to learn more about Korean natural farming and you could do it in your own backyard if you want it. So. Uh, but uh, let's see, I guess it's about time for some questions here. Yeah, if anybody has any more questions, just drop them in the chat. Um, Ty, that was great. I feel like it is such a, a, a great window into the world of regenerative and Korean natural farming where people, you know, I think it's, they, they maybe think, okay, I understand soil is, you know, has some nuance to it or breeds, but it's like, down to the water that you're giving the animals. Like every, when you are doing the type of farming that you're doing, there's so much thought and care that goes into every single element that um, I, I think it's just such a wonderful thing, a little window to, to showcase to people all the amazing work that you're doing at the farm. Um, so we have a question that I think uh, can go to either of you or both of you. Um, what are some things that you're most excited to try in the future moving forward? Uh, you can go first. Uh, I mean, the, the fermentation of, of being able to ferment our chicken feed would be uh, incredible. Um, nobody's done it on a, a scale of that nature. And so being able to uh, show and prove out uh, some financial benefits from fermented feed as well as increased health outcomes would be uh, really uh, pretty exciting. And we're trying to find uh, and breed some heritage birds that are more economically viable. The red dorking breed mentioned in the intro is my favorite bird, but it takes a long time to grow out and there's a limit to how much people want to pay for chicken. So finding a way to bring in some of those heritage attributes, richer taste, amazing dark meat, uh, longer legs, increased uh, foraging desire, finding a way to breed those into our chickens. So we'd really like to um, start breeding our own land race specific to our farm and location to breed some kind of those chickens in the future. Uh, 
I would say my answer is actually very similar. Just scaling in general is very challenging. Um, I think the amount of trial and error on both my part and our part, we uh, undersold for sure uh, when it came to approaching this project. And we're still honestly in the midst of it. We're still trying to figure uh, a lot of it out. So I feel so that I have a, a pretty good handle on um, the ferment pro the fermentation processes that we do at Emmer and Rye and, you know, scaling them to the point where they're viable for uh, other people to use, for farmers to use, to talk about all those things is always the hardest part. It's very easy to make a liter of something. It's very hard to consistently make gallons upon gallons um, <laughs> every week. The same as that Ty was talking about where he's saying like, I, you know, I'm now getting hundreds of chickens every week. Um, and continuing to uh, produce it and and have hold the standard that you know we have for both the food at the restaurant, the ferments at the restaurant, the tie for the chickens that he's producing. Um, I think that in a lot of people's heads, uh, they they think smaller is better. So like small, the smaller the scale, the better it is. Um, and what uh, people like myself and Ty are doing, we're doing it on two very different ends of the spectrum. Is almost challenging that a little bit more and saying there are benefits to slightly larger scales of things like he's talking about that uh, the economic viability of getting this this quality meat to more people. Uh, the same thing that you know we're talking about at Emmer and I is consistently being able to create these things in a way that more people can enjoy. Um, but also balancing those scales of saying, you know, we're producing this much and figuring out a way to do it in a way that we're still uh, happy to uh, create and serve and be proud of. So, yeah. Awesome, great things on the horizon. Um, we have some more specific questions for you, Ty. Uh, first off, how did you figure out uh, that it was the pH of the water and not something in the feed and, that, and would that apply to other animal farming as well? Yeah, so, you can get your feed tested. Uh, ours comes from an organic mill and I was pretty confident uh, in their robust testing. Um, with an organic feed, there is more testing, um, but you can take a sample of your feed. You can send it off to AM or any number of feed analytic places. They'll, you can get a mycology test and any number of things. And so uh, I and another uh, one of my friends in the area used the same mill. He's at a larger scale than I am and he had already done the additional testing uh, and kind of was felt fine using this feed. Um, and then finding out about the water, it was just kind of a, well, duh, kind of moment whenever you're like, oh yeah, Hill Country water is known for having a lot of bacteria in it. If chickens consume so much per a smaller size, it would make sense that even a trace amount of some bacteria would cause a problem. I can't believe I didn't think of that. <laughs> so um, yeah, you can also send off your water to get it tested if you'd like. Uh, you can do some bacteria test. You can do the pH. I have a little uh, pH pen here that whenever I'm making water, I just put the tip in there and it tells me what the pH is. Um, so you can use some of those tools if you want to find out the pH of your water. Uh, you can send it off for testing if you want, you know, further bacteria and, and such information. So All right, and then another question in regards to um, the pH. Do these lactic processes accumulate over time in the pasture and are you balancing soil pH in other ways through Korean natural farming? Yeah, so that's a good question. The amount of lactic acid that goes through the bird and comes out on the other side is not massive. Um, so it's not a huge, it's not something that's going to quickly shift the pH of the soil uh, just because of the sheer volume uh, of the soil and the small amount of lactic acid. Uh, but if you get into more Korean natural farming, there are a number of other solutions that you can add uh, or remove at certain amounts to adjust uh, a pH imbalance in your soil or to achieve a pH imbalance that if you're looking to do blueberries or something that requires a particular pH to be successful. Um, it's a much longer conversation and more specific to Korean natural farming. 
but no, we're not seeing massive swings in the pH of our soil. We get it tested annually uh, with a regular acid test at AM. I think it costs like $12. And then you can do what's called a Haney test, uh, which is done, uh, was developed at the NRCS in Temple, Texas by a guy named Haney that is a much better reflection of the health of your soil. So if you get a chance and you're serious about doing uh, soil testing, get a Haney test done, do your regular NPK for $12 a day and M. And then I think it's like 30 bucks, 40 bucks, still fairly inexpensive to do a Haney test. I get mine done at Ward Labs, W-A-R-D. Uh, and it will tell you a lot more information and more information than uh, as a non-vegetable producer than I know what to do with. But uh, no, we haven't seen massive swings uh, in our pH in the soil. Great. Um, do you have any recommendations for books about Korean natural farming? So Korean natural farming is a very particular <clears throat> area of study and there's not a ton of published material. So Dr. Cho, C-H-O, is kind of the father of Korean natural farming. And so he has a book, uh, it's, it's a, one of those that you get done at like Kinko's and is, is a bound book. It's not like a printed book, uh, but you can get that one. There's a Korean natural farming Facebook group uh, that uh, there's a, basically only two books. One of them is by the guy that runs the Korean natural farming Facebook gr group. His name is Drake. Um, so I would suggest joining that. There's also a KNF poultry page, which I'm the moderator of. So you could join that Facebook group for more particular to uh, chicken information from Korean natural farming. Uh, and Dr. Cho has his own book. So there's really only two. Um, if you reach out to me via email, uh, ty at westfoldfarm.com, I could provide some links to those. Uh, but yeah, those are the only two printed materials that I know of. That's, that's great. That was ty at west, westfoldfarm.com for people who- Yeah, just my name, ty ty awesome. at westfoldfarm.com, so. All right, well, if anybody has any last questions, you can drop them in the chat now. I think we, uh, we've we gone through everybody's chats. We are like right on time. It's amazing. Everyone had wonderful questions. You guys had wonderful answers. Um, and I think- Yes, Alfred's dropping in Sandor Katz, The Art of Fermentation. Um, I also dropped in some links to Noma Guide oh, yeah. um, and Westfold Farms also in there, which remember they're starting this Sunday at TFM at Mueller if you wanna check them out. And um, I encourage everyone to follow Emmer and Rye, follow Westfold Farm and um, get to some fermenting. So. Uh, I think uh, we are, we're going to wrap up now, but thank you both so much for sharing your incredible knowledge with us tonight. And um, I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. And that wraps up the Austin Fermentation Festival 2021. Great. Thanks for having us. We appreciate yeah. you guys taking the time to sit with us about a very particularly narrow uh, topic. Yeah. Uh, that while interesting to us, uh, it takes a particular interest to sit around and talk about it for an hour and a half. So yeah. we really appreciate it. Yeah, Wonderful. no, I, I also want to say the same sentiment. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are fans of Emmer and Rye and, you know, we would not be what we are without our producers. So, um, yeah, please uh, get some of Ty's chicken and enjoy it at home and see it for yourself. And then come up here and try it as well. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, when they would, the study of turning things into gold, alchemy, that was pretty much what happens. I show up at the back door and then what I had when I sat down at the table was, was wizardry. So, um, yeah, come try it, try your own hand at it, and then uh, come try the delicious dishes here that they've got. Amazing. Thank you guys. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. You guys have a good one. Yeah.